In March of this year, two Chinese fintech unicorn startups went IPO in quick succession. One was Futu, which can be translated as the path to riches, and the other was Tiger Brokers. Both of them are online brokerages that help Chinese people invest in securities outside of mainland China, primarily equities listed in Hong Kong and the U.S. Both of them raise money via primary shares as well as concurrent private placements, netting well over a hundred million dollars each in proceeds. And they've also both debuted at roughly a billion dollar valuation. And both of them count strategic corporate investors amongst their largest shareholders, Tencent in the case of Futu, and Xiaomi, as well as interactive brokers in the case of Tiger. There are even more similarities between these two companies, but what you're probably asking now is, what exactly is this online overseas brokerage business, and why is it thriving, or at least why is it thriving enough to give birth to not one but Two public companies in the same month. We've been wanting to cover these two players for a while now, especially since it's become more and more obvious that U.S. listed Chinese equities seem to be more volatile than their Nasdaq or NYSC peers. Indeed, some even think that they trade more like their A share counterparts, which is to say, not always driven by fundamentals, with extreme price fluctuations that are often blamed. On an irrational and largely retail investor base, could the rise of these overseas online brokerages have something to do with it? And if so, why would that be the case? And what can we expect for the future? If you've already got or are thinking of getting some exposure to U.S. listed Chinese equities, you'll definitely want to listen to the rest of this episode. The president's key economic team goes to China.、Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. Hi everyone, we are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. We are a bi-weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so that you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of Pandaily dot com, an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. I am one of your two co-hosts, Yingying Lu, and I'm your other co-host, Ray Ma. We'd like to acknowledge our partners, Deal Street Asia and SubChina, creator of the Seneca Podcast Network. In addition to Tech Buzz, you can also find Seneca, which covers current affairs, Nui Voices, as well as Ta for Ta on Women, the business-oriented China Econ Talk, and this high-scene Seneca Business Brief from China's leading business magazine. Speaking of Deal Street Asia, their annual private equity and venture capital conference, the Asia PEVC Summit, is set to take place on the 17th and 18th of September this year. To register. Go to their website at DealStreetAsia.com. And finally, as always, thank you for writing in and for tweeting at us with your feedback. We love hearing from you, and we're always looking for ways to improve. If you do like what you hear, please give us a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. By the way, before we get started here. We highly recommend you to take a listen to Tech Buzz episode forty, which talks about Shanghai's newest technology innovation board, but also provides a pretty complete history, if we may say so ourselves, on the Chinese stock market and its various exchanges. If you know nothing about the Chinese stock market, this is definitely a good time to press pause and listen to our episode forty. You see, the two markets are very different. The U.S. is an application-based system, while China is approval-based. The U.S. is dominated by institutional investors, while China is still mostly a retail market. And although that episode is primarily told from the perspective of companies looking to list and why they might want to choose to IPO overseas, the end result is that the domestic Chinese stock markets are not really attracting the best quality companies. 
not even the ones from China. And so naturally, in the search for quality assets, it follows that there must be incredible demand for foreign listed securities, especially those in the U.S. on the Nasdaq or NYSE, and also those listed in Hong Kong, the fourth largest exchange in the world. As securities brokerages increasingly moved online and became more tech-driven and more global, of course, this slice of trading volume has increased exponentially. But also, once in a decade events such as U.S. listing of Alibaba in 2014 really helped kick this trend into high gear. So, how big is this market really? Well, pretty much everyone quotes the Oliver Wyman report on the wealth tech industry, so we've included that link in our transcript. A few key statistics jump out. In terms of online securities trading, by 2017, China had already accounted for over one third of the global volume at nearly 13 trillion dollars. Yes, these are not billion dollar markets, but trillion with a capital T. And they are growing very, very fast. In the next few years, Chinese offshore financial assets, consisting of equities, fixed income, insurance, and alternative assets, will grow at a compound annual rate of 28 percent to reach 2.1 trillion USD by 2022, more than triple what it was in 2017. And even more specific and segmented than that is the Chinese overseas online retail securities market, which was already about three hundred billion dollars in 2017, and is expected to more than quadruple to one point four trillion dollars by 2022. And by then, over fifty million Chinese people are expected to have overseas investments representing ten percent of their total investable assets. By the way, that's still very low, though, compared to forty percent in the UK and twenty percent in the US and in Japan. Now you see why everyone is jumping in. It shouldn't surprise anyone anymore that not one but two companies went IPO in this space last quarter. But aside from the fact that Chinese people are generating wealth at an unprecedented rate, and that the penetration of their overseas investment is still very low, what else accounts for this extremely high growth rate in overseas online brokerages? Well, there is the do-it-yourself attitude of millennials, so they're not generally looking for traditional securities firms with advisors and such, but also because since Chinese investors are overwhelmingly retail. Recall that about 80% of the volume in China can be attributed to individual investors. Online brokerages are great at providing the news, reports, analytical tools, and community features necessary to make investment decisions and trades in a mobile-friendly format. Okay, now that we have the market opportunity out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the two companies. First up is Futu. So. It's founded in 2011 by Tencent employee number 18, Li Hua, aka Leaf Li. Futu is your typical startup story of the entrepreneur scratching his own itch. You see, as Tencent's first new grad hire, Li joined Tencent pre-IPO and then got into Hong Kong stocks because, well, that's where Tencent ended up being listed. By the time he was 30, he already had financial freedom, and so he decided to pursue his passion, which at this point had become stock investing. He found the systems used for trading Hong Kong securities to be archaic and not very user friendly, so he was intent on making his own. When he tried to get investment from Tencent CEO Pony Ma, he was initially met with some resistance. The field was already pretty crowded, but there were lots of trading software companies in China, with everyone wanting to be China's Bloomberg, and a few had even managed to get listed by 2012. But when a huge bull market hit Hong Kong in 2014, after a long lull, Li found his opportunity: help Minglanders trade in Hong Kong. Becoming Bloomberg was no longer sexy. It was time to create China's Charles Schwab. After eight years in the trenches, whether or not Futu has been successful is still too early to say. 
The company went public in mid-March of this year, pricing at the high end of its range, raising 90 million U.S. dollars and up as much as 46 percent in its first day of trading, making it the fifth best-performing IPO as of its debut date this year. And that's pretty respectable, but significantly smaller than the rumored $300 million raise in its confidential filing last year. But let's not forget that it did hold a concurrent private placement of $70 million to private equity from General Atlantic, which means that its total amount raised is about $160 million. So not quite the rumored $300 million, it's true, but it's still a pretty substantial infusion of cash. It's pretty respectable. The founding story of Tiger Brokers is actually eerily similar. Tianhua Wu was a graduate of Tsinghua University's computer science department and went to work for NetEase early on as an engineering lead on its search engine initiative. Same as with Li Fli, Wu received stock options for his work and really got into U.S. equities because that's where NetEase was listed, on the NASDAQ. Like Lee, he also felt that the software and online brokerages he was using to trade were not up to par and not localized for his needs as a Chinese user. By 2014, at age 30, he decided to quit his job at NetEase and start Tiger Brokers, also to solve his own problems. And just like Futu, Tiger, also known as Up Fintech, priced above its expected range, but in a downside IPO raising $104 million. It rose 37% on its first day of trading, although if you had bought in at that price, you would have seen your fortunes decline by about the same percentage as of now, since the company is worth just over $600 million today, down significantly from its billion-dollar debut. Futu, on the other hand, is down just barely 10% from its IPO price and is currently worth almost twice as much as Tiger in market cap. Well, one of the main reasons is that Futu is a profitable company, whereas Tiger is massively unprofitable, which is curious because they have a similar and actually relatively simple business model. They charge a commission on trade executions and provide margin financing. To support their customers, both provide market data, news, research, and their own suite of analytical tools. Pretty much like every other online brokerage, but Tiger has a negative 131% net margin, which is pretty ugly when you compare it to Full Tools' net margin, which is in the high teens. Part of the reason is that 77% of its revenues come from commissions, as compared to just half or so of Full Tools' revenues. Tiger is also extremely aggressive with its pricing, charging as low as 39 cents for a 100 share trade. So even though it supposedly has an almost 60% market share in terms of trading volume for Chinese investors trading U.S. equities, its revenues are only about one-third of full tools. I guess this is consistent with their corporate narrative that they want to become the e-trade of China. Futu, on the other hand, has about half of its revenues coming from its margin lending business, which is undoubtedly much more profitable than just clearing trades. However, even though Tiger's first quarter results also showed that it was pushing to grow its margin lending business, expenses also went up as headcount almost doubled. Commissions were also not as large as expected because investors were more cautious and made less trades in the U.S. markets. Aside from a different revenue structure, Fultool may also benefit from its close affiliation with Tencent. I guess Pony eventually decided that it was worth betting on his former employee after all, and so they became the largest shareholder, continuing to, today, own about one-third of the company post-IPO. Other owners, by the way, include Matrix China at 5% and Sequoia at 3.5%. Tencent is so closely affiliated with Futu that if you go to their website at futu5.com, the word Tencent shows up in a little speech bubble on the very logo of the company itself, with the words 战略投资, or strategic investment, right below it. It kind of makes sense because Chinese fintech has been so fraught with fraud in recent years that for sure it would help to lean on the credibility of an established brand like Tencent to make customers feel better. You are asking them to deposit their hard-earned cash into your accounts, after all. 
Tiger, by the way, is also funded by not one but two corporates. Its second largest shareholder is Xiaomi. But more importantly, it boasts the largest online brokerage firm, Interactive Brokers, as an investor at eight percent. And in almost every press piece, it is also mentioned that Jim Rogers is also an investor, although his holdings aren't large enough to show up in the prospectus. Jim Rogers, by the way, is uber famous in China. If you haven't heard of him, look him up. He's known for having founded the Quantum Fund with George Soros, retiring. And then traveling around the world and becoming a television commentator, and then moving to Asia in the early 2000s. In China stock picking circles, he's revered somewhere not too far below Warren Buffett. But okay, so everyone's got great financial and strategic backers, but just how many customers did that get these guys? At the time of IPO, Futu boasted over 5.6 million users, which sounds impressive, until you consider the fact that, like most other Chinese products, only a very small number of users actually pay. In Futu's case, that's a little over 2% at 133,000 people who have actual assets in their trading accounts. Tiger doesn't fare much better with just 81,000 customers with deposits. That's five percent of its nearly 1.6 million registered users. Trading volume, though, for both was basically 120 billion dollars last year, which could mean that the average Tiger user is more active than the average Futu user. Maybe so. In either case, both brokerages boast very young user demographics, a feat which fellow U.S. brokerage unicorn Robinhood has used to propel itself to sky-high valuations. Futu's average client, by the way, is only 34 years old, and almost half of their users work in IT, internet, or financial services. With 97% of paying customers remaining on the platform since the beginning of 2017. If you think that's impressive, consider that Tiger has an even younger client base, with over 70% who are under the age of 35. And over 85% making more than 40,000 U.S. dollars per year. That's not bad by American standards, and definitely considered high earners by Chinese standards. Those are the highlights of these companies, the ones that are usually mentioned in press releases. But there are so many risks. I know. Reading the risk section of both companies' prospectuses makes me wonder what exactly is. Not at risk. For example, Futu tells us that its online onboarding process is not kosher with the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, aka the HKSFC. It's also not sure it needs a brokerage license in China, seeing that it provides brokerage businesses to Chinese customers and actively markets there. But strictly speaking, it doesn't conduct business on the mainland. In the same vein. Tiger, in its prospectus, disclosed that the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission, or CSRC, aka China's SEC, sent out a notice expressly warning that no companies have been approved for providing overseas trading services to Chinese citizens, and this was back in 2016. Tiger apparently promptly communicated with the CSRC and got their blessing after removing the words securities. And stock from their PRC entity, but same as Futu. While both companies are technically using foreign entities and foreign licenses to trade, it's possible that the CSRC may step in and make additional requirements of them. But the common risk both companies share is that of the issue of foreign exchange. Under current rules, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. Affectionately abbreviated as SAFE, S A F E, strictly limits each Chinese citizen's conversion from RMB to any other foreign currency to be the equivalent of fifty thousand U.S. dollars a year. In the past two years, especially, converting currency has become extremely strict, if almost impossible, as you must provide documented proof for why you need the funds, and only a very few use cases are accepted. Such as traveling abroad, investing directly into foreign stock markets is very simply prohibited. And while neither Tiger nor Futu engage in any currency conversion activities on behalf of their customers, 
they do not have any control of the methods in which their clients are getting their monies exchanged, which means that if their clients are using shady avenues or misreporting their intentions, Futu or Tiger could be involved in the investigations. And in March 2016, Tiger was inspected by the relevant authorities for exactly these reasons. It doesn't seem like the authorities are paying too much attention these days, though. Probably because the market is still so small. But as it grows, there's no telling what extra burdensome policies the companies may have to put in place in order to satisfy regulatory oversight. And according to the founder of Futu, 95% of their clients' assets are already parked overseas, and so are not subject to China's foreign exchange restrictions. But again, if those clients did so illicitly, the brokerages could still be investigated. Finally, another issue that has popped up has been that of IPO share allocations. Tiger has started an underwriting business in order to get allocations of IPO shares for its clients. It was listed as an underwriter in its own IPO, of course, but also most recently for Yunji, a membership-based social e-commerce platform in China that went public just last month. For this deal. Many clients did not get their promise allocation and took to social media to complain of fraud. It's unclear exactly what happened there, and Tiger blames it on Yunzi's last-minute decision to downsize its IPO. But a slew of negative press came out, and the fact that Tiger essentially relies on interactive brokers for all of its U.S. equities execution came to light, and was declared its Achilles' heel. Tiger is just. A quote unquote paper tiger, the media headline screamed. It's not a brokerage as much as it's just a sales channel for interactive brokers. That isn't really news though, since its own prospectus calls it an introducing broker for IB. But I guess for many of its retail customers, this somehow came as a shock. Tiger's CEO fought back, however, and said that all Chinese brokerages who support trading of U.S. listed securities use interactive brokers as their backend because it's so difficult to procure a license in America. It's just that others don't disclose this. I believe him. While Futu's prospectus does disclose that it aggregates client orders and collaborates with a quote qualified third-party brokerage companies for execution and settlement. Unquote. It doesn't specify which firm that is. It may very well be IB. It's also not super clear just how much investors think this is a key competitive advantage, because when Futu announced that it obtained an FINRA license to clear trades in the U.S. just this week, the stock did go up, but only by four percent. Maybe no one really cares if you're simply an introducing broker or a full-fledged one, as long as you own the customer. This does, however, highlight a key difference in the two markets when it comes to IPOs, because in China, retail investors can access IPO shares by maintaining a certain minimum asset value in their trading account for the few weeks prior to the IPO, and that can range from a few hundred to fifteen hundred U.S. dollars, depending on the exchange. But in the U.S., these shares are generally unavailable to you unless you're an institution or a high net worth individual. In China, as long as you fulfill the asset requirement, which is designed to be accessible, you can then enter a lottery for the shares available and wait to see how your luck plays out. You don't even need to have the funds ready or locked up before the transaction. And once you've won the lottery, you get until 3 p.m. that day to wire the funds. Most Chinese investors consider this a guaranteed winning trade. That is, you basically can't lose money on the IPO. There's no lockup involved, so you can sell as soon as you like. But most people will choose to hold for at least a few weeks because, on average, new IPOs in China tend to at least triple in value in its first ten days of trading. No joke. That is the average scenario. Now, most IPOs in the U.S. also experience a first-day pop, but not always. Sometimes you get very lucky and see the 66% pop that recent IPO Zoom technologies experienced, and other times you get an Uber, which had a drop in price on its first day. Now, guess which companies Tiger Brokers offered to its clients an IPO? While、well, there's Sogo, 
I T E, Hu Ya, Pin Duo Duo, Billy Billy, 360 Finance, Tencent Music, of course Yunji, and more. Many of the recent U.S. listed Chinese companies, of course, but also companies such as Zoom, which it claims to have been the only online brokerage to get IPO allocation for. And while most marketing documents do acknowledge that closing below IPO price is a real possibility, a la Uber, it's still true that most IPOs do tend to go up when trading opens. Paired with the fact that there's no limit to price changes in the U.S., unlike in China, where prices are capped daily at movements of 10% in either direction, and you have eager Chinese investors who see the U.S. IPO markets as one of the best bets for low risk and high reward trades. Could this be what's accounting for the sudden pops and subsequent drops in U.S. listed Chinese IPOs? It's possible. Journalist Stella Xie wrote an interesting piece for the Wall Street Journal back in March, where she talked about how China's "quote unquote" night traders are moving U.S. stocks. They're night traders because it's nighttime in China when they're executing trades during the U.S. daytime. Because they are Chinese, most of their trades revolve around the aforementioned U.S. listed Chinese companies. Although there's also plenty of interest in firms like Tesla, which enjoy a very good reputation in China. Because many Chinese companies often begin with relatively small floats, that's shares for trading, it may not take that many investors piling in to result in drastic price fluctuations. According to one Reuters article, Chinese companies float between four and nineteen percent of their shares, while non-Chinese companies range between fourteen and eighty-six percent. The less shares, the larger the swings. And it's entirely possible that that's what's been happening with regards to these Chinese IPOs, because as we've already explained, most Chinese investors consider it a must-win bet and do not care at all about the underlying fundamentals of the company. Beyond IPOs, though, there are many Chinese retail investors, especially those who work in tech, who believe that they understand the Chinese companies better than U.S. analysts. When Pinduoduo was accused of discrepancies in its regulatory filings. It only spurred some young Chinese investors to buy more of the stock, believing it to be under unwarranted attack. According to the article, Wang Haitian, a 30-year-old former journalist who now trades stocks full-time, saw the short seller's report as a buying signal. Our judgment of Chinese internet companies is more grounded than foreign investors, he said. Not all Chinese investors are so bullish, however. When the Blue Orca short selling report on Pinduoduo came out. It was actually analyzed in detail by numerous Chinese analysts and finance publications. Not all were so brash as Mr. Wang, and many took the allegations seriously. However, they also generally concluded that these accusations were weaker than those that had been leveled at Chinese companies in the past, and thus did not constitute an existential threat to Pinduoduo. In fact, there is a good group of Chinese investors who blame the volatility on American newbie retail investors. In Chinese internet slang, newbie investors are called jiao cai or chives because they're cheap and easy to grow. Basically, they're not only stupid but also helpless, easily manipulated, and plus there's wave after wave of them, endless chives to harvest. Go bu wan the jiao cai. Chives are used in all sorts of contexts, by the way. Not just the stock market, although that's where it originated, but cryptocurrency, P2P lending saw all sorts of innocent chives lose their hard-earned savings. It's actually quite tragic, despite the snarky meme. And actually, in the case of American retail investors, it's possible that some of them are crypto investors who got redirected to Chinese stocks after the crypto winter descended. Because, well, where else are you going to find this kind of volatility? It's hard to say how systematic this is, though, as we only see some anecdotal evidence of people complaining that their crypto group on the free trading app Robinhood has been taken over by folks shilling Chinese stocks, such as Neo and Chutoutiao. Either way, the enthusiasm some American Jiaotai have for Chinese stocks have the Chinese people confused. The American stock market has become just as irrational and opaque as the Chinese A share market. They complain. No one knows anymore why a stock is moving up or down. 
Finally, there is one last thing I feel like we really must mention that will further help explain why Chinese investors love U.S. equities. Yes, they are irrationally optimistic when it comes to IPO shares, but also they enjoy certain tax benefits on their investments. This is because, according to IRS rules, as long as you declare that you're a non-resident alien, that is, you don't live here and you don't hold citizenship, then you do not have to pay capital gains taxes to the U.S. government. What about dividends? You ask. Well, China has a treaty with the U.S. where the tax rate is 10% instead of the usual 30%. And interest on bonds? Well, as long as they're directly held, are also tax-free. So all you have to do to enjoy these advantages of not being a U.S. citizen is to fill out the W-8 BEN form every two years. That doesn't mean, of course, that Chinese people don't pay any taxes whatsoever. Strictly speaking, they're still subject to Chinese taxes. Although the Chinese tax code very kindly lets you deduct the amount you've already paid to the U.S. IRS, so you're not double taxed. Realistically, though, most Chinese people seem to be getting away with not reporting their U.S. gains. So yeah, there's that tax thing driving demand from China for U.S. equities. The loophole will probably close soon, if not already. But meanwhile, it helps explain some of the market growth. So that's pretty much all you need to know about Chinese overseas online brokerages. Shall we go ahead and summarize what we learned today, Ray? Okay. So in March of this year, two unicorn fintech companies, both catering to mainland Chinese investors who want to buy securities abroad, went public in the U.S. Futu was founded by an ex-Tencent employee and, of course, received investment from Tencent. While the other, Tiger Brokers, was founded by an ex-NetEase employee and was funded by Xiaomi and Interactive Brokers. They both offer media, community, and tools for users, and are neck to neck in trading volume. However, Futu has three times as much revenue as Tiger and is profitable, whereas Tiger is extremely unprofitable because Futu has done a lot more with its margin financing business, which accounts for half of its sales. Both companies, though, are subject to a lot of regulatory risks, including foreign currency exchange and potentially needing to be licensed in China in the future. And while Futu just received a clearing license this week, thus far both companies effectively act as introducing brokers, meaning they don't actually settle or clear any of their customers' trades, but instead they aggregate order flow to be executed by a licensed partner entity, someone like Interactive Brokers, for example. Not knowing this, some Chinese investors have accused Tiger of fraud when they found that they didn't get their promised allocation in a recent Chinese IPO. They were all up in arms about it because not only was it a breach of contract, IPOs in China are pretty much considered fail-safe investments. They're super low risk and super high reward. This might explain why it's suspected that Chinese investors are putting a lot of money into the new Chinese IPOs and pushing them. To large pops that burst just a few days later. Um, <laughs> Neo, Luckin, and pretty much every other Chinese IPO that has listed in the last year. No kidding. The seesawing stock price of some of these U.S. listed Chinese securities could give you whiplash. In fact, Reuters has called this cheekily trading with Chinese characteristics. There are plenty of American traders who also have a gambler's mentality, though, so that's not helping either. But whether the fluctuating prices be due to Chinese night traders or U.S. newbie chives, a potential and serious consequence is that large institutional investors may start taking notice and put off investing in or avoid Chinese companies altogether, exacerbating the credibility problem that many Chinese listings already have. And the numbers aren't helping. Last year, investors in U.S. listed Chinese IPOs lost an average of 16 percent. Whether investors decide to sit out will be the age-old battle between greed and fear. What do you guys think? Which of them will win out? Are you putting in more money into the market these days, or pulling out? Let us know by tweeting at us at Tech Buzz China. All right, that's all for this week, folks. Thanks for listening.
As a reminder, episodes will now be available every other Friday instead of on Wednesdays. We really enjoyed putting this together and we're always open to any comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily at TechBuzzChina and my personal Twitter account is spelled G-I-N-Y-G-I-N-Y. And my Twitter is spelled R-U-I-M-A. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. Pandaily.com is an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Sha Wang and Kaiser Guo. Our interns are Wang Menglu and Mindy Xu. See you guys in two weeks.